Sally, you know some things my mother doesn't know. <laughs> Hope she's not watching. <laughs> wow, look at you. I, I want to thank you, Jeff, for everybody's thanking you. Uh, I had not met Jeff until I arrived here in Oxford. Um, and there's two ways to get to know someone, one by relationship, but there's another way to get to know a person, I believe, and that is to understand them through the people that they attract and that are drawn to them. And the intelligence and the discernment and the intention and the quality of values that you express through the people that you gather around you is extraordinary. And I want to thank you so much for who you are and what you are doing in the world. Thank you. And one of those people is Sally, <laughs> whom is equally extraordinary in terms of who she attracts and brings to her side. And I have worked with your staff now. They are extraordinary. I want to thank them, but I also want to extend my thanks to the people who aren't here, to the hundreds of people and the volunteers and the janitors and the sous chefs and the cooks and the waiters and the maids and all the people who make this moment possible who cannot share it, but who deserve our gratitude. And I want to just say thank you to all of you. <clears throat> you know, every generation has the uh, vanity, the express vanity that it lives in historic times, and I suppose that's always true. Uh, we, I don't think, have that vanity. Uh, I think we have a different one, which is not a vanity but we live in civilizational times. Uh, these times we live in will decide whether, in fact, there is a civilization. Now, we are told and given different estimates that we had 20, 25, maybe more, maybe less years in which to reduce our carbon emissions, to control carbon in the upper atmosphere so that it does not exceed 450 ppm, that temperature rise on Earth does not exceed 2 degrees centigrade. And to do that is an extraordinary thing. And even then we don't know what will happen because the carbon in the atmosphere will last for centuries after that. And we may have to even begin a long process of drawdown which are technologies and techniques we don't fully understand yet. And to do that, a friend who's a physicist made a list of what we'd have to do. And for the next 25 years, we'd have to make a new 10% efficient solar panel every second, every second for 25 years. We'd have to create a new 50 square meters of solar mirror every second for 25 years. We'd have to create a three megawatt wind turbine every day for 25 years. We'd have to create one new three gigawatt nuclear power plant every week for 25 years. And if you don't want to do that, then we have to create 250 square meters of solar panel every second for 25 years. And we'd have to create 100 megawatt geothermal plant every day for 25 years, and then every second, one Olympic-sized swimming pool of algae for biofuel every second for 25 years. And on top of that, we have to cap the energy consumption that the world consumes today at 16 terawatts, despite the fact that two plus billion people will be joining us soon. So there's the shopping list. And on top of that, as you know, we have to feed and nourish 9 billion people. We have to educate those who do not have it, our children, the girls, and boys around the world. We have to eradicate poverty. We have to reforest a billion hectares of land on Earth. We have to stop ocean acidification 
the death of coral reefs. We have to recharge our aquifers, expand our wetlands. We have to create affordable health care in the world. Apparently not in the United States, but everywhere else we have to. We have to squeeze into our ecological footprint a just and meaningful society. Now there are many of you, or not you, but many people who will say that this is impossible. And the reason it's so nice to be here with you tonight is to be with people who say that it is possible. And that's why we're here. 10 years ago, I noticed in my lectures, in my talks, that I would receive business cards from people who were in NGOs and volunteer organizations and institutes and foundations. And as they piled up in my house, I brought them home. I had thousands of cards. And I decided to do one thing, which is to count, not just the cards in my bag, but I wanted to know how many organizations in the world are here today to address these issues of poverty, of climate, of injustice, of deforestation, of all the different social and environmental issues that we uh, are addressing together collectively. And so I began to count. And I got to 30,000. I was pretty excited. I was more than the Catholic Church. I thought, this, this means something. And I got to 50,000. I got to 100,000. And the numbers kept going and going. And with Becky's help, I would like to show you just a video to give you some sense of scale. Because numbers don't really say something. Numbers go in and out of our head. They're sort of abstract and they're conceptual. But um, what we see soon on the screen, <laughs> Becky's nodding, um, is a list. And it's a list of nonprofit organizations from around the world. And the reason I show them to you is not to call them out individually or collectively as being more important than others, not at all. The reason I show this to you is to give you an idea of how many there are. For if we were starting to play this now as we are, and we sat here all night and tomorrow and all day Friday and Saturday and all day Sunday, if we stayed here for a week 24-7, I would come back in the room and tell you that you'd have to stay yet another week. And at the end of those two weeks, I'd say you'd have to stay two more weeks. And after watching this for a month, I'd come back to you and say, it's only one month more. In other words, you'd have to sit here for two months, 24 hours a day, watching at this rate, the names of your brothers and sister organizations in the world who are addressing the salient issues of our time. That's who you are. That's who we are. This is our family. This is the fastest growing movement in the world. Make no doubt about it. The person who made this for me was a big fan of Star Wars. and. Uh, <laughs> And he felt like two months was too long. Um, and so you'll see, it just starts to fade out into the sword or whatever you want to call it, a Star Wars. We'll see. As, um, it's way ahead of me. Here it goes. Anyway. The number of organizations, by the way, is approximately two million. Is that's how long it would take to look at the names of two million organizations. And uh, here we go. We're gone now. It's jumping. I don't know what's going on here. But as I finished, if you will, the count and know that it's innumerable, I then went to another area, which is I wanted to know where do we come from? Where are our roots? Two million organizations didn't happen overnight. It may be extraordinarily quick and fast now and rapid in its growth, but it has very, very deep roots culturally. And you have to go back, what Paul Farmer talked about last night, you have to go back to the abolitionist movement in 1787, where a group of Quakers and a couple of Anglicans got together in a print shop in London and decided to abolish the trade in slavery in the UK. In the world, they hope, but starting with the UK. 
But what was so extraordinary about that is that at that time, people did not organize themselves on behalf of people they did not know, would never know, and from whom they would never receive direct or indirect benefit. It was so odd that people in parliament derided them. They made fun of them. They called them liberals, <laughs> do-gooders, activists, progressives, oh my god. Terms that were used pejoratively then as they are now. Not much has changed, right? But today, as so elegantly underlined by Dean Peter Moores, in his opening, the aughts, the decade of the aughts, have starkly underlined the institutional bankruptcy of the culture of self, this aggrandizement, this culture of beggar thy neighbor. And this meme that began in the 19th century with the abolitionists is now, I think, and the dean, I think, underscored that, has become the measure of what it means to be a meaningful human being today. We do what was odd then as a matter of fact today. We think nothing of it to organize our lives on behalf of people that we don't know. It's an extraordinary thing that's happened. Now, this movement addresses what Paul Farmer calls the pathologies of power. This, those hoary infirmities of privilege that have caused untold suffering to all people. And invoking Farmer's metaphor, we can say that in a sense, this movement that has no name is humanity's immune response to political corruption, economic disease, and ecological degradation. I mean, we have now an economy that tells us the ultimate pathology, the ultimate fallacy, which it tells us that it's cheaper to destroy the earth in real time than to renew or restore or restain it. You can print money to bail out a bank, but you cannot print life to bail out the planet. At present, essentially, we are stealing the future, we are selling it in the present, and we're calling it growth. We will look back at that as with the same abhorrence as we looked at those slave ships that Paul showed yesterday. Astonishing that a whole global culture could do that, be taught that in its business schools and in, in its economic schools, that that is economic growth. But that is exactly what we're doing. We can, however, just as easily have an economy that is based on healing the future rather than stealing it. We can either create assets for the future or take those assets from the future. One is called restoration, one is called exploitation, and whenever we exploit the earth, we cause untold suffering to other people. And as you well know, working for the earth and for its people is not a way to get rich, but it is a way to be rich. One of the awardees tonight, Scott Gilmore of Peace Dividend Trust, described this change perfectly two nights ago. He left his prestigious job as a diplomat because he wanted to do something that he could be proud to tell his daughter about. Now he was a diplomat, but his job was to manage files. And now, as quoting Scott, he can turn to his daughter and say, now I help people. The Catholic nun and author Karen Armstrong talks about this idea of people helping people. And she describes the source of this is the actual age, 200 to 900 BCE. And this was a time of great barbarity, of cruelty, tremendous violence, and people were repulsed by it. And there was this revulsion to what people saw around them in everyday life. And out of this came an uh, extraordinary number of teachers and sages, Socrates and Sophocles, Buddha, Mencius, Lao Tzu, Confucius, uh, Rabbi Hillel, and many others. But these teachers, some of which have, have religions or ways of life now surrounding them, didn't give a fig about creating a religion or enlightenment or not interested in monotheism, and they cautioned their 
followers to not believe. What they were interested in doing is creating a new type of human being. These people were creating social movements. That's what they were doing. That's what you're doing. Right? This origin of to doing unto others, you know, which you would have done to you, or the opposite, to never do unto somebody, which you would not have done to you. This golden rule that emerged during that time informs everything that we do. You know, this is real policy. Now, when Paula Kravitz and I, two nights ago, we were early for a reception, we went to Christchurch to uh, Evensong, to the Vespers, and um, extraordinary, if you have not heard, the Christchurch Choir, which is well-renowned and famed for good reason, please do. It's extraordinary. We walked in, the sun's coming through the stained glass windows. Um, and there, after the choir stopped, we're at the second reading, uh, the deacon or somebody stood up and a beautiful gravelly voice read Matthew 5, 3, 12, which is probably maybe the most famous or one of the most famous passages in the Bible. It is the beatitude where Mark quotes Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm sure you know it well, where he says that blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are, uh, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, when I heard that as a child, I kind of thought I was supposed to get on my knees and pray. And when I heard that two nights ago, I realized what Jesus was saying is get off your butt and do something. <laughs> right? Jesus, too, was creating a social movement. Right? That's a social manifesto in a sense, asking us to create, in President Bill Clinton's world, uh, words, integrated communities of empowered people. Now, again and again, what you hear in the environmental and social justice movement is, oh, man, it's too late, we're not doing enough, we failed at Copenhagen. I mean, you hear this litany of failure. This is the only movement that circles the wagons and shoots inwards, you know? <laughs> But I would caution us, you know, I don't think you've ever been on a team where the coach says, man, you guys are getting worse every day. I'm depressed, I'm getting more so. You haven't put a run up on the board yet, you know. We're making fun of, people are mocking us and so forth. I don't know if I can keep doing this. That's not how you win. The way you win is to recognize that what we are doing is extraordinary. COP15, wasn't organized to succeed. What succeeded at COP15 is who came there and got together in the information that was exchanged. I was with um, Sir David King last night at dinner. I mean, he bounced right up. He's going to meeting after meeting, new proposals, new solutions, new ideas. The thing here is that what we've taken on is the whole tamale. It's not like we're trying to fix one thing. We're trying to fix everything, the whole industrial system. Every node, every aspect, every part of it needs to be addressed and reimagined because it's reimagining what it means to be a human being, right? And if we, if, if we were winning, we would be doing the wrong thing. That would be too small. We're going to get defeated again and again and again. We're going to get laughed at. That's how we know we're on the right track. This is big. I want to just mention one thing. When I was researching this, one thing really struck me. And I don't know about you, but I read Emerson in high school and just couldn't stand it. I didn't know why they assigned him. Um, and he seemed really uptight, you know? And I read him again recently, and I realized you can't understand Emerson when you're 17 years old. You don't have the experience, right? But two years after, Parliament here passed and read the law banning the trade in slavery. Emerson's wife died, and he took a boat from Boston to Malta, came up to Buda, Italy, and landed 
in Paris on his way to see his friends here in the UK, John Stuart Mill, uh, Wordsworth, and others. And he stopped in Paris at the Jardin de Plantes, which is this extraordinary botanical garden put together by the Jusso family, Bernard and Antoine. And what they had done is gathered the plants and the corms and the seeds and the bones and the, the, the creatures that came from explorers all over from the New World and had brought them and dumped them in Paris and London and Amsterdam and other places. And their job was to organize this bounty of nature that was streaming in from the world in some recognizable way and gave it some order. And they did. And they arrayed things by color and shape and form and morpho uh, morphology. And Emerson, who was depressed and mourning his wife, and you can see in his journal entries how down he was, goes in there and he looks at everything and he has this epiphany, this epiphanic experience where he sees the web of life. He sees that everything is connected, that everything is nature. There is no non-nature. And at that time, there was such a division between society and nature, right? And it all came together as one. And not surprisingly, when he came back, his first book was called Nature. And in that, he says, I have confidence in the laws of morals as of botany. In the laws of morals as of botany. I have planted maize in my field every year, and it has never come up strychnine. My parsley, beet, turnip, carrot, buckthorn, chestnut, acorn are as sure. I believe that justice produces justice and injustice, injustice, right? And this integration of nature and justice you know, that is in his book, he became a mystic from then on. And the first person to buy that book was Henry David Thoreau, who was at Harvard then. And he asked Emerson to come to his class, the senior class talk, Emerson did. He went to Emerson's house that night and said, what shall I do? I've studied classics. You know, they didn't have a business program then. And <laughs> he was a pencil maker. And Emerson said, keep a journal, which he did from that night for 7,000 pages until he died in 1862. And the story we know most famously about Thoreau is walking to town to Concord and being arrested by S Sheriff Sam Staples for not paying his poll tax. He had not paid it in years before because it banned and prevented African Americans from voting. This year, he didn't pay it because of the Mexican-American War, which was illegal, where Texas Rangers were raping Mexican women, and he would not pay his tax. He was thrown in jail. And after that night in jail, he gave a talk on it. He wrote an essay with the sterling title of the duty of submission to civil government, which might have been forgotten, except in 1866, four years after he died, somebody retitled it on civil disobedience. And exactly 40 years later, to the day it was printed, somebody, we do not know who, but at the Indian Times in Durban, South Africa, handed an essay to a slight solicitor who had proclaimed with his Muslim brothers in a meeting to protest the Black Act that he would get arrested as a solicitor, Mohandas K. Gandhi. And Gandhi says that it had a huge influence on his formulation of Satyagraha. But 50 years after that, after that, almost to the day after Martin Luther King had been elected head of the Montgomery Improvement Association, after the front of his house had been blown up with his kids and wife in the house, after he had armed his house with rifles and guns, <laughs> somebody gave him civil disobedience and Gandhi's autobiography. And within a week, he was incorporating these into his sermon at the Ebenezer Baptist Church. Now, why do I mention these three? They would have been famous, well-known people. But what I want to point to is this, is that who knew about the Jusso brothers? Who was the person who retitled that essay? 
Who were the women who created the Montgomery Improvement Association? Who was the person who gave that essay and that autobiography to Martin Luther King? What I'm saying here is that nothing we do is inconsequential. There is no such thing. There is only consequential inaction. Right? And we cannot know the results of what we're going to do. We cannot know the future. We can relax in that sense. <laughs> you know, take that burden off your shoulder. The only thing we can do is hone and purify our intentions in the world and how we express those intentions. And the rest we give over to each other and to this extraordinary experiment called humanity. Emerson posed one other question, which I'll end with. And he asked rhetorically, what would happen if the stars only came out once every thousand years? I wondered the same after reading that. Well, I think there'd be weeks of preparation. There'd be lots of parties before, probably speeches. Boring, who knows, but speeches. There'd be lectures about why it's only every thousand years. But there'd be some serious winemaking, some serious dance lessons. I'm sure 12 new religions would happen that night. There'd be lots of, ki lots of kids would be created. That's for sure. But the stars actually come out every night. Uh, and we watch TV. <laughs> but I think for you, it is different. Your stars come out every day and night. They are Gertrude and Josephine for you, Andrew and Kenya. Um, they are the thousands of Afghans who are employed due to the work of Scott Gilmore. They are the livelihoods created by you, Michael Jenkins, in the forest where there were none. They are the indigenous lands same, saved by Berto and Carlos of Amazon. They are the communities sustained by the work of Ambrosius and Silvarius of Telepac. They are the millions and millions of girls <clears throat> who have gained and retained their honor and dignity because of Mali and Tostan. And they are the newfound lives discovered through the work of Mark Friedman. And for me, those stars are also beaming at me right now, they're you. All of you are demonstrating and embodying what it means to be a new human being, what the sages of the actual age were talking about. Because they said, if you could create and become a human being full of generous and kindness, generosity and kindness, you would change the world. Thank you to the awardees, past and present, for your work and dedication your endless enthusiasm, your literal brilliance, and for creating a world that we can believe in. And thank you for everyone else for making this world so stunning, a place I want to be in, a place I'm happy, to, a time I'm happy to be born in. A gift of the work that we share is something that is the most special thing that could happen in a thousand years. Anyone can make despair possible, but it, to make hope possible takes real genius and real heart. Thank you very much.